We're going to focus today in our message on overcoming addiction as we think about um, God's blessing of total fitness in our life and fitness in various dimensions, whether relational or other kinds of fitness. Certainly one of the great obstacles to our health and flourishing is the power of addiction. And so let's consider what the Bible has to say about that in the book of Proverbs as well as in other areas. As we do that, we have to face the fact that we live in a chemical culture. That message is telling you that just about the only way to have a good time involves alcohol. It must. And so you see constant advertising where the people drinking are always smart and witty and have clever things to say. The beer companies have all the best ad agencies. Um, they often have beautiful people um, looking very sexy while they're drinking and they're just having a general good time whenever you see that in advertising. Alcohol is essential for many people flying on an airplane or attending business events or going to private parties or going on dates or attending weddings. Um, alcohol has got to be there or it just isn't a real celebration. Uh, for people even to accept each other sometimes, you need to have alcohol or some other mood-altering substance, weed or something, to have a ticket to acceptance with your peers. And this is all part of the environment that we live in, which is sending all of these signals, and we need to understand that that's the situation we live in. And we need to understand that there is a danger in assuming that something is normal and healthy just because it's common. Is alcohol evil? Well, Proverbs 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. That's not a real shiny assessment of alcohol. And yet, um, it also says in Psalm 104, God makes wine that gladdens the heart of man. And Jesus' first miracle was changing water into wine, not wine into water. So we need to take both of those strands of what the Bible has to say about wine, that it can be a terrible affliction, an awful tyrant, and yet it can also be a blessing from God. The short of it is wine is a gift of our Creator, but it becomes a curse when misused. I've seen too much of the curse. I kind of wish I didn't even have to say the first part, that it's a gift of our Creator, because I've seen um, people killed because of drinking. I've seen families wrecked because of drinking, lives ruined. And so I, there's part of me that just wishes I could preach and say, it's bad, 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 never drink. Uh, but that's not quite the whole message of the Bible, and my job is to preach the Bible, so there it is. Um, it's a gift of God, and it's one of those gifts that um, goes way amiss. Uh, in the hands of broken people. Well, there's a couple of forms of misusing alcohol. One is getting drunk yourself. And in Scripture, drunkenness is grouped with sins such as idolatry, witchcraft, swindling, homosexual acts, and orgies. That's not great company. Drunkenness is in very bad company in the Bible. And so getting drunk is a serious sin, according to the Scriptures. Getting others drunk is also a serious sin. Just to take an example, the prophet Habakkuk says, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors till they're drunk so he can gaze on their naked bodies. And people will sometimes use alcohol to exploit others. They'll use alcohol or drugs if they're out to get into a sexual relationship with somebody whose normal inhibitions might say no, but if they've had enough to drink, maybe they'll say yes. Or you want to get somebody to do something else that under their own choice and their own moods they wouldn't do, but with a few drinks, they just might. Getting drunk is serious. Getting other people drunk so that you can use them is even more serious. Some of you who know your Bible may recall what the very first sin after the flood was that's recorded in the Scriptures. Noah, that great man of God, got drunk. And his son... Um, found him drunk and lying naked in his tent, and he um, mocked his father, and it led to one of his sons being cursed. So from the very uh, earliest eons of time when the world was getting its new beginning, the first thing we know is that 
the godliest man on earth, the only one whose family was spared from the flood, is getting himself drunk and getting his offspring in trouble because of it. Well, Proverbs says, listen, my son, and be wise, and keep your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. Sometimes uh, people who are in financial trouble think that it has nothing to do with their drinking, but it often does, as this verse indicates. A little later in that chapter, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind imagine confusing things. You'll be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me up, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? What a picture. Um, it's not in the technical language of modern psychology or anything like that, but it captures uh, so tellingly the impact that drunkenness and addiction can have on people. What's the harm of, of being a drunkard? Well, we've already seen the seriousness of it as a spiritual sin. It's listed among those kinds of sin that characterize people who have no part in the kingdom of God. So there is a spiritual damage to um, addiction and drunkenness. There's the physical damage. Uh, who has bruises? Who has woes? Um, those who drink too much. And so it speaks of the physical bruises and bloodshot eyes. Then we also know that it's not very good for your liver. Um, it can contribute to obesity. There's a lot of physical damage that comes when you're addicted to alcohol or to other drugs. The intellectual distortion is there where the, the person thinks he's having a great time when he's actually just been beaten within an inch of his life. When he thinks he's the life of the party and really remembers being a fun and witty guy and everybody else who was there remembers him barfing on their shoes. You know, there's, he, he's swaying like he's on the top of the mast of a ship and he remembers things so differently, but all he really wants is another drink. And it's so telling the way that, that intellectual distortion and denial kicks in in the life of an addicted person. Financial ruin, we've already looked at. Um, the, the drunkard winds up in poverty and all the way there he thinks something else is to blame for being poor. Emotional woes, you know, who has woes, um, who has sorrows. Uh, again, it's not using the modern language of alcohol is a depressant, but it is. Um, and it has that depressing impact on people's emotions. Relational conflict. Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. It results in bruises. It results in beatings. It's not a good thing for relationships when you drink too much or are addicted. And if you go down this list, you'll notice um, if you've been paying attention to my series of messages on total fitness, it covers all seven areas negatively. Spiritual fitness, physical fitness, intellectual, financial, emotional, relational, and vocational. Our calling, our ability to do our work. The things that, that God challenges us to do and even put us on earth to do are adversely, negatively affected when alcohol or addiction to something else is warping our life. Proverbs 31, it's not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Their job is to understand the laws, the laws of God and the laws that apply to humanity. And their job is to look out for those who are the weakest and the neediest in society. And if they drink too much, they're going to forget their job. And they're going to do it very badly. And this is true not just of kings, but of all of us who have a calling and a vocation and a purpose in life. Your purposes are distorted or destroyed when you're trapped by addiction. Isaiah says, priests and prophets stagger from beer and are befuddled with wine. They stagger when seeing visions. They stumble when rendering decisions. And that's not 
out-of-date stuff either. There are pastors and leaders who struggle with addiction, and it obviously is going to have a devastating impact on their ministry and their ability to carry it out. Whatever your calling in life is, uh, you may have talent from God, you may have a really sense that this is important stuff to do, and if addiction takes over your life, you're not going to be able to do it the way you were meant to. And so it leads to failure in, in so many different areas of our lives. Let's just think a moment of, of two kinds of drunkards. One kind is what I might just call party animal. The other is an addict. The party animals are the people who go out and drink, and they choose to drink. They associate it with having a good time. They think it's fun. They think it's funny to get drunk once in a while. What's wrong with that? And the party animals aren't addicted. But that doesn't mean that it's therefore safe and good and healthy. Because people who party and get drunk wind up sinning and they're risking harming themselves and others. The, the most fatal accidents in driving are caused by people who were drunk while driving. They weren't all alcoholics. They just went out for a good time and somebody ended up dead. A good many of the sexual assaults that have occurred didn't occur when both parties were sober. Maybe that happens in some cases, but alcohol or some other mood-altering substance is involved a lot of the time. And uh, unwanted interaction with people, um, unwanted pregnancies, some of the abortions that occur, um, sexually transmitted diseases, these are all uh, aspects of the party animal lifestyle. And then there's another kind of drunkard, the addicts, they're controlled by craving, and they use alcohol and drugs to cope. They don't decide, hey, it'd be fun to go out and get blasted for a weekend. Maybe that's what they sometimes think to themselves. And some of the party animals um, become drunkards. There's others who, you know, I, I can think of many examples in my own mind. I knew kids I knew when they were 17, 18, 21, who drank a lot. They got drunk, and they grew up. And they got smart. And by the time they were 30, they were no longer out getting bombed and wrecking their life. And some of the other kids who were drinking buddies with them, they never got out of it again. They couldn't. They couldn't stop. They got addicted. And addicts are controlled by the cravings, and they use alcohol and drugs to cope with life. They have a hard time getting through life without help from that, at least in their own minds. And so their misuse of alcohol isn't just a sin to repent of, but, it, but it's a disease to be treated that has, has a grip on them that has to be broken. So as, as we look at both kinds of drunkards can be very devastating. I, people end up in prison because they were party animals and did something crazy and evil and uh, a crime while they were that way. But that's uh, addicts, of course, for them and their families. It's an ongoing thing, a heartache for years and years on end. When we think about overcoming addiction, one of the first things to think about is, well, let, why not prevent it? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I said earlier that wine is a gift from God, and therefore it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody should abstain from alcohol. Although if you do, I can assure you, you're not going to be a drunkard and you won't get addicted to it. Um, but there are people at higher risk groups and then you really do need to think hard about abstaining totally. And you, you might want to quote the passages about wine is a gift from God. Okay, but the Bible also says uh, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. You know, something that might be okay for somebody is not going to be okay for you. So if you come from a racial or ethnic group with a high rate of addiction, you're at a much higher risk. And for instance, Native Americans, there's often a 80% or higher addiction rate among people who are part of a Native American culture. If you're part of that culture or have that in your lineage, you need to be aware of that and realize that whatever the Bible might say about wine is a gift from God, it's deadly for you and you've got to stay away from it. And if you have any addicted close relatives, you need to stay away from it. Because your likelihood, if you have a brother, sister, father, mother, uncle, or aunt with a major drinking problem, you'd be very wise to leave it alone because you have a much higher vulnerability to it than uh, the rest of the population. And if you yourself have ever had some of that party animal in your past or have had trouble with alcohol or any other drug, then you're higher risk too. And so if you're in any of these groups, uh, an ethnic group or uh, close relatives or 
previous personal problems, it is wise to avoid alcohol totally. I'll make no apology for saying that. It is, that's the course of wisdom. The risk is high and, and the consequences are devastating. Part of it, as I said, is not just your own attitude and whether you get drunk or misuse alcohol. Part of it is how you deal with others. If you're at a private party, don't serve alcohol if you know a struggler is going to be there. If you have eight people over and you know one of them has a drinking problem, you say, yeah, but I want to keep the other seven happy. It wouldn't be a party without alcohol. What about that one? The Bible says, are you, for the sake of your own freedom, going to destroy somebody for whom Christ died? Say, I can, I can drink when I want. I can serve what I want. Oh, yeah? What if you know that there's somebody trying to quit drinking or has a problem? Do you want to be the one serving it to them? If you're at a larger public celebration, such as wedding receptions, don't serve alcohol or just serve enough to toast the event. That may sound like uh, an extreme statement in our culture. The first church I served in, I found that um, at wedding celebrations, at receptions, there were a lot of people that were getting drunk, including sometimes elders in the church. And so I thought it was not a real good idea to start the wedding in the church with the Lord and end it with the devil. Um, so I said, I'm just not going to do weddings if people want to have an open bar at their reception because there's just too much uh, trouble going on. And so there were a number of people who wanted to have a, a real wedding, so they chose to have it with alcohol instead of with their pastor um, because that, that meant more to them. I will, it, it was a difficult thing, and I'm not always sure that I was making the right decision. Maybe I was pushing that too hard. But I do know in that church, people knew I took the problem of alcohol seriously, and I was able to help a, a good many who had difficulties with it. I remember sitting in a room with four people. One of them said, you know, you're making a big deal about this alcohol stuff. I don't know anybody in our church who has a problem with it. One of the other four people in the room says, well, I'm a recovering alcoholic. You know, some people just are clueless about what's going on. Of the weddings that I was not involved in, I know for a fact that there was an immediate family member in each case who was an alcoholic. I mean an immediate family member, a parent or a sibling who was an alcoholic. And it had to be part of that family's wedding instead of their preacher. That's the grip that this can have on us in public events. And having said all that, um, if you choose never to drink alcohol and you know somebody else who likes beer with their pizza or wine with their supper, do not judge those who enjoy a drink because the truths of Christian freedom are still there. But you, I trust you get what I'm saying. Be very wise and very cautious when you're serving alcohol to other people. Even if it's part of your own personal freedom, know who else is involved in the party you're hosting or in the group of people you're getting together because you just might be contributing to the stumbling of people for whom Christ died. So let's be wise and, and be loving in the way that we deal with others. What are some of the warning signs of alcohol addiction? I'm focusing mainly on alcohol. It's mentioned in the Bible. It was the most commonly available drug then. It still is today. Um, there's a lot more now today that are also available, um, some of them still illegal. But we're going to focus on alcohol addiction in particular and realize that much of what's said about alcohol addiction applies to other forms of drug addiction as well. How do you recognize whether you might have a problem or somebody whom you love or know might have a problem? Well, one sign is high tolerance. Some people say, I can't really be an alcoholic or have a drinking problem because you know what? I can drink three or four and it doesn't have any impact on me at all. And they take that as a sign that, therefore, they don't have a problem with alcohol. That is one of the warning signs that they do. Because when you can handle your liquor, <laughs> your liquor's handling you. When you're able to drink several drinks with almost zero impact, you've already built up a high tolerance. Another symptom is blackouts. You just don't remember. But the trouble with blackouts, you know, it's like people with... Uh, Dementia, they don't know what they don't know. How do you remember what you don't remember? You have to have somebody else's version of events because you have a complete wipe on your memory for certain periods of time. And so one sign that, that alcohol is really getting a grip on your life is that there are blank spots that other people talk about. And you say, I never did that. I don't have any recall of that. That never happened. 
Well, if several people say it happened and you were in the room when it happened and you don't remember it, that's, that's a blackout. Another sign is preoccupation. You think about alcohol a lot. You think about where you might be able to get your next drink and when you're going to be able to enjoy it. Another sign is you use it to relax. And you have a hard time relaxing until you've had a drink or two or maybe more. Another sign is you find yourself drinking alone more often, not just sharing a drink with several friends. Another is you find yourself gulping drinks. You drink them fast and in quick succession because sipping a little bit now and then is not having the desired effect. And so you've got to gulp it. Another is you protect the supply. You start planning. You make sure that it's going to be there when you want it, when you need it. You wouldn't want to find yourself in a pickle where you didn't have a drink when you wanted it. And another is loss of control. You intended to have one or two, and you ended up having a lot more than that. One of the difficulties is that in your own mind, you still had only two. Many alcoholics have had only two drinks. Any objective person standing there counting might have had the number rise much higher, and in their own mind, they stopped at two, maybe three at most. But at any rate, you might say, well, you know what? Uh, there's maybe one or two of those there, but, that, but that's no problem, or six, but I know there's two for I don't have any blackouts, and I'm not gulping. I don't have a problem. Well, any one of these is a significant sign that there could be a problem. And if there is a, as many as half of them, four of these signs, it is almost certain that you are already addicted to alcohol and that disease will simply progress on its normal course until your life is ruined and you are dead. Okay, that's how serious uh, these warning signs are. So if you see even one, it's pretty serious. If you see as many as four, not a, you don't need all eight. You'll, you'll get to all eight in due time. If you got four, you'll be headed for all eight unless um, something changes. Someone has written, if it fills the empty spaces, if it's the essential part of any successful gathering, if it's what you look forward to at the end of a grueling week or day, if it's the thing that relaxes you, lubricates you, frees you, steadies you, prepares you, then you've crossed the line from responsible to irresponsible drinking. I know people who tell me they can do their work better if they have a drink or two. And I know. Um, if it's the thing that, yeah, all I need is a little relaxer. All I need is something to steady me a little bit. Um, you know that the grip is already there. And one of the terrible things that we read about in Proverbs and that, um, that alcoholics experience is just this symptom of denial. They hit me, you'll say, I'm not hurt. You're only missing a few teeth maybe and bleeding a bit, but they beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? The, the way you remember events, the way you experience events is so far from the reality of the situation. Or you have prophets um, Addicted prophets saying, come, each one cries, let me get wine. Let us drink our fill of beer and tomorrow will be like today or even far better. Tomorrow can look pretty rosy if you have enough drinks in you. And then tomorrow arrives and in the best case scenario, you have a nasty headache. And in the worst case scenario, your family's in shambles or you've just had a car wreck or something else terrible has happened. But denial is this ability to think tomorrow's just going to keep getting better the more I drink. Or, um, you know, last night um, I took a beating, but I, I'm feeling no pain. And a couple more drinks and you'll really be feeling no pain. Uh, the, this denial, the inability to see what's going on in your life. If your spouse says something to you that it's wrecking your marriage, no, it's not. We've got other problems. You just quit nagging me. I wouldn't need to drink so much. Uh, the, the denial that goes on. I only use once in a while. I could quit any time I want to. I just don't want to. Life's okay the way it is. And my troubles, you know, we've got a few, but they're not. they got nothing to do with the drinking. And in fact, if the troubles went away, I probably wouldn't um, drink as much either. Along with those addictive behaviors of denial, you get just downright dishonesty. One of the reasons for dishonesty is you're just lying to hide your habit. You don't want other people to know stuff. You even lie to yourself a good deal and believe your own lies. Um, you also lie to get approval. You want other people to think well of you. And so you don't let people know 
you, you don't tell the boss, hey, I can't come into work today because I, I've just got a splitting headache. I'm in no condition. Um, I'm planning to stay home and get a few more drinks today to help steady me. That's not what you tell him. You say you've got a bad case of the flu or something else has gone amiss. But you don't tell what's really going on and why you really can't show up. Another form of dishonesty, of course, is stealing. Addicted people sometimes steal from their parents if they're kids. Uh, sometimes if they're not kids anymore, they'll be stealing from people nearby because they've got to pay for their habit somehow. And when you're already financially ruined, you've got to get money from somewhere. Another addictive behavior is manipulation. And people who are addicted become masters of controlling other people, of getting them to do what they want. How does that work? Well, one way is to play on other people's fear. If you're an addict, they fear that if they don't do what you want, you're going to go on a bender. And they think that maybe if they keep you happy, you won't be giving them a reason to drink or to use. And so you can get your way by playing on their fears. You can get them to feel guilty for your drinking. I wouldn't drink if you were a better kid. Sometimes alcoholics will say that to their own children and destroy their own children's souls by blaming their little kids for their habit. They'll blame their spouse. And that's all part of the sickness. Um, it's somebody else's fault. They'll lay guilt on you and they'll use that guilt to get you to do things their way. And if all else fails, there's always pity. Uh, you should be feeling sorry for me because I am in a difficult state of affairs. And so you'll find that in many cases an addicted person has a lot of people in orbit around them doing what they want. And those are, all, those are just a sampling of the behaviors that go well beyond drinking or, or snorting something or shooting something into your vein. These are the, the relational patterns that often creep in in addictive behaviors. And it's not just then the, the individual person who struggles with addiction, it's a family disease. And as part of that family disease, uh, here are some of the things that affect a family. Uh, you wind up being a deceiver and dishonest like they are. You've got to call the boss when they're in no shape to call the boss, and you've got to cover for them. You lie on their behalf. You try to fix their messes and make their situation better, and you make a drinker's life more tolerable, and you enable them to go further and further down that path of addiction. You get caught up in denial. You say, I, I don't think it's so bad. Even you believe lies, or you half believe them. They say they're going to quit, and you know they've said that before, but you know how that turned out, but you want to believe it this time, and so you wind up living in an, an unreal world. Then there's just the worry. The worry over the addict in the family, over the, how the bills are going to get paid, what's going to happen to the various family members who are being affected negatively. And after a while, you get as obsessed with curing the addict as they are with finding another drink. Uh, part of a family's affliction can be that their drinking is controlling you by you've got to figure out some way to cure them. Well, you didn't cause it, you didn't control it, and you can't cure it. Okay, that, that's something that family members need to understand if they've got an addicted person in their family. Um, but nonetheless, we, we want to stop it. Sometimes we think if, if you could just hide the bottles, get out, find all the bottles that they hid and got them, pour them down the drain, get them out of there, that would help. No, it won't. You just, you cannot prevent an addicted person from feeding their addiction. But part of the family disease is you give it your best shot. You do what you can. Sometimes nagging, accusing, threatening, we're going to leave. Yeah, but you've bluffed so many times that the addict knows it probably won't happen. Um, you feel angry. Sometimes you feel angry at them for wounding you. Other times you turn on yourself and you say, maybe they're right. Maybe if I were just a better person, they wouldn't have the problem they have. So sometimes you're feeling angry at them. Sometimes you're angry or just feeling guilty yourself. And so in various insidious ways, the, the addiction um, seeps into the family and, and distorts your life. And it's very important then for addicts to come to an understanding of how the disease element of it affects them, but also for family members to understand how that affects their family dynamics. Some of you may have grown up with a person who was an alcoholic parent or may have had an alcoholic spouse or maybe do even right now. 
And then it's important um, to, to learn more about what goes on with alcoholism. To learn, you can maybe attend a group like Al-Anon, which is for family members of alcoholics. Or you can do some reading and, and study on it or talking with other people who know the situation well. Uh, but to be free of it. And one of the first things to be free of is the notion that you could cure it. That you are partially to blame and that you could fix it. Um, you just can't. Uh, you need to be able to live with it and be able to live a, a life of freedom before God without your whole life and your whole outlook being controlled by the addicted person in your family. Well, we need to, if we're going to be free, we need to be under the influence. That may sound like a strange thing, but the only way to be free from the influence of addiction and alcohol is to be under the influence of someone much more powerful. The Bible says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. Does that mean somebody who ever got drunk will never make it to heaven? Or somebody who is addicted can't possibly be saved? No, it doesn't, because that very verse says um, a list of people, including drunkards, and that lifestyle, that's not the kind of lifestyle of people who inherit the kingdom. And then it goes on to say, well, that's what you were, but not anymore. You've been washed, you've been sanctified, and you've been rescued. And so the, the good news is that you can come under the influence of a power much more positive and much stronger. We don't belong to the night or to the darkness. Those who get drunk get drunk at night. There's a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. And part of our growth in Christian life is leaving behind the kingdom of darkness and its deeds and its addictions and living in the kingdom of light. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, to squandering who you are and, and your opportunities and talents. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. That's the key, to be filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God and to have His power helping you in all of this. And the people who have had um, the, the most success in dealing with addiction are people who have uh, been part of 12-step recovery groups. Um, such as Alcoholics Anonymous or a more specifically Christian-themed Overcomers Anonymous, but groups that, that follow 12 specific steps. And we need to understand, uh, some people think, oh, that, those 12 steps, they're just pop psychology. Why would I bother with all that? Well, the 12 steps came out of what was called the Oxford Movement a little over a century ago, and it was a, it was a Christian movement. It's rooted in biblical truths. It's rooted in the biblical view of God even, that God is a great and powerful God and a God who also gives you another chance. A God who doesn't condemn you just because you've blown it up to this point, but a God who gives you a fresh start. That's the kind of God that you've got to believe in if these 12 steps are going to be any good at all. And we know, of course, that God in Jesus Christ, He gives us the second chance because He paid for all the mess that we've done in our own lives and He cleans it up by His blood and then by the power of His Holy Spirit. So let's, let me just um, look at these 12 steps with you and a few scriptures that correlate with them. The first is, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. I can't manage my life anymore. I can't break the power of this addiction on my own. That is the absolute first step until you reach that. You're never going to be free because you still don't know you're in chains. The apostle said, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's the first step. Who is going to deliver me? I can't do it on my own. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Well, the Bible, of course, speaks of God's power often. Power belongs to God, not by might or by human power, but by my spirit says the Lord. That step two after admitting your powerlessness is, I came to believe that there is a power, a real and living and strong power that could restore me. Step three, we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. I have made a pretty good mess of my life, but if God ran it, it could be better. And I'm going to turn my life and my choices, my will, over to His care. As Jesus put it, um, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You, you follow me. And our response is to pray as he taught us, your will be done. I'm handing my will over to his will. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. You look back and you take stock. And maybe you're 
mind is still a little clouded by um, the experience of being in addiction and being in denial, but you, you make the best inventory you can of the things you know that you've done wrong in. And you go as far as you can. Maybe, maybe later on you'll make a little more of an inventory when you're a little clearer in the head. But you start somewhere. You make a searching and fearless moral inventory of yourselves. As David prayed in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And you take that inventory and you, you just look back and say, these are the ways that I've done wrong. And then the next step is admitting it. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. We admit to God. Psalm 32, I acknowledged my sin to you and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Psalm 32 says, when I was silent about it and wouldn't admit it to you, I just kept wasting away. But when I acknowledged my guilt to God, um, then God forgave it. We need to admit it to ourselves. I know my transgressions. And then this step, this part of step five, I admitted to another human being the exact nature of my wrongs. Confess your sins to each other so that you may be healed. I've been on the receiving end of some people's step five, and it's not always happy listening. There are many um, just terrible things that people have done um, during their time of addiction. And yet, when, when you take this step, when you admit to another human being, and when you hear from another human being that those sins are forgiven, there is a tremendous freedom and liberation that comes from that. And so the Bible, um, we don't necessarily always have to confess every little thing we've ever done to this or that person publicly, but there is a role for confession to fellow believers who can then encourage us and assure us of the pardon of the Lord Jesus Christ. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. We're not just saying, I'm a rotter, I'm a rotter, I'm a rotter, and here's my list. Um, but we're ready to say, these are defects, and I want God to change them. Count yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. So you're ready for God to take over. And you're wanting God to make you the person that he wants you to be. And then step seven is not only being ready, but asking him to do it. We humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Grant me a willing spirit. Keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. We're asking God to remove those shortcomings and to keep changing us. We made a list. A list of all persons we'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them. That's a difficult step to say, here are the people that I have harmed, and here's my list. Well, the book of Numbers um, commands the people of Israel, any man or woman who wrongs another is guilty and must confess the sin, and they must make full restitution for the wrong they've done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the person they've wronged. So this making of a list and a willingness to actually do what you can to make up some things you cannot make up for. Uh, no sin can you truly make up for. That's what Jesus takes care of. But where you, can, where you stole, give it back with some extra. Where you wronged somebody, you try to make it right to the degree that you can. And then step nine is we not only made a list and determined to do it, we did it. We made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except, you know, there's cases when to do so would injure them or others. Some of the things you've done to people, they just don't want to see you again. Sorry, too much water under the bridge. And it might, you might determine that it would do more harm than good to try to get in touch with those people again to address the ways that you may have hurt them. So if you think that it would be more harm than good, then um, maybe you shouldn't try to make amends. But where there is any possibility where your admission of wronging them and your attempt to at least improve the situation to the degree that you're able would be helpful, then, then go for it. Jesus says, if you remember that your brother has something against you, go and be reconciled to your brother. You know the story of a little shorty Zacchaeus in the Bible. 
Um, everybody thought he was a lost cause, a traitor, collaborator with the Romans, a rip-off artist who was raking in all the money from being a chief tax collector. But Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I want to go to your home today. And Zacchaeus stood up and said, hey, I am giving half of my wealth to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to pay back four times the amount. That's a changed heart <laughs> where he can let go of his money, where he wants to um, do good to those whom he's wronged. And so step nine is where it's possible, unless it's going to be harmful to somebody, I'm going to, I'm going to admit what I did to them and I'm going to try to make it better to the degree that I can. Step 10, we keep it up. We continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. In the Christian life, we well, are not perfect once you become a Christian. So if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And that's, we've already seen that is one of the deadly parts of addiction is deceiving yourself. And it's not just alcoholics who do that. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So you keep taking inventory, you keep admitting it when you find that you've been wrong. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You, you want to keep through prayer, meditation on God's word to know God better and better. That's what it boils down to. And then step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. That was the basic motivation of Alcoholics Anonymous. We found a way that addiction was broken in our lives and that we were set free. And it really wouldn't be free, fair to just keep that to ourselves. And in fact, part of our remaining sober comes with dealing with people who are still struggling. That reminds us to stay sober, and it keeps us engaged in doing the work of helping them to be free where it's possible. Uh, Jesus told a man who he had just freed from a demon, go back to your village and tell how much God has done for you. Jesus said to his disciples, freely you received, freely give. Continue in what you've learned. So you keep on keeping on and you keep on sharing the good news. You know what? If you have no addiction problem in your life, at least in your own head, um, you don't. These are 12 steps uh, that are eminently worth following just because it's part of keeping, um, keeping the skeletons out of the closet, keeping the uh, garbage from under the bed, whatever you want to call it. Um, dealing with the crud that builds up in your life and giving it over to the Lord and giving your relational matters over to the Lord and living in the power of forgiveness and seeking forgiveness. These are the things that make a tremendous difference, not just for people who struggle with addiction uh, to drugs or alcohol, but for all of us. So in summary, these 12 steps, you, you admit your inability, your lack of control. You believe in a great power. You surrender to the power of God and to His wisdom. You take a moral inventory, you confess to others, to God, to yourself the wrongs you've done. You're ready to make changes. And you ask God in prayer for that change. You list those you hurt and you make amends where it's appropriate. And you keep on keeping on. You pray and meditate and you help other people who struggle with addiction. And you can't do that alone. Um, that's why Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous groups exist, is so that people can be together and support each other in all that. So if you or somebody that you know struggles with these things, then it's very important to not try to whip it on your own. You need God, and you need other people, and you need to be honest with each other as you struggle with these things. Some of the most radiant Christians I know are people who were addicts, who were drunkards, and who have learned to live honestly before the face of God in utter dependence on God because they know that, I mean, we all know Jesus' words, without me you can do nothing, and we can maybe recite those words, but they know it. <laughs> without Jesus, uh, without the power of God, they would never be able to be free. And yet the, the power of God helps them to overcome the strength of addiction in their life. And so I just want to encourage each of you, whether you have a problem with a specific chemical addiction or not, take very seriously the power of relying on God. 
faith in Him, honesty with each other, seeking forgiveness, living every day to help others to walk in the path that God has set you on. Let's pray together. We pray, Father, that you will be very near now to people who may be struggling with addiction. We pray, Lord, that where their minds are clouded by the power of denial, that you'll help them by whatever means you deem appropriate to see their situation as it really is and to cast themselves upon you and on your saving power and to bring into their life others who have been through that struggle and have been set free. We pray, Lord, that you'll also give each of us wisdom as we deal with others um, in our life. Help us not to place unnecessary stumbling blocks or temptations before them in the way that we deal with or, or serve alcohol if it's not a big problem for us. We, we pray that we won't make it a problem for those who maybe still struggle with it. We pray, Lord, for those too whose lives have been hurt or twisted by the um, the drinking or addiction of, of another family member. Maybe, Lord, it's long in the past, and yet it still um, has an impact on us. And so we pray that you will set us free from all these things, and uh, more and more, Lord, bring us into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We pray in Jesus' name.